Soldiers of Christ, arise and rise and put your armor on. Strong in the strength which strong God, in the strength which God supplies. Strong in the strength which God supplies through His beloved Son. Strong in the Lord of hosts and in His mighty power. Who in the strength of Jesus, who in the strength of Jesus trusts. Who in the strength of Jesus trust is more than conqueror. Standing in his great might, fight with strength, his strength endures. But take to arm you, but take to arm you for the fight. But take to arm you for the fight, the panoply of God. Leave no unguarded place, no weakness, no weakness of the soul. Take every virtue, take every virtue, every grace. Take every virtue, every grace, and fortify the whole. That having all things done and done and all your conflicts past. You may or come through Christ alone. You may or come through Christ alone and stand entire at last. Good morning, everyone. This is Wilson Stone, and we are going to, in just a few minutes, have the Sunday school lesson for the Scottsville Church of Christ. We hope everyone is enjoying their. They're primarily their stay at home, and I certainly hope that we're getting about ready to go back to, to work and certainly about ready to go back to, to meeting uh, in the, in the uh, church buildings across, uh, across the, the county here. But again, uh, we seem to be getting uh, better in terms of, of the virus, and, uh, and hopefully we can escape with just as few of sick folks as we can have and, and everybody ready to get back to, uh, to, to normal. Certainly, we're pleased, we'll be pleased to have Brother Randy Wells preaching the lesson in just a few minutes. Um, we have a, um, uh, a wonderful group of people here. We would be delighted for you to join us when we re-meet. Uh, we hope that you can um, enjoy Sunday School now. If you don't have a Sunday School book, we would just ask you to come by the building and, and leave your name and phone number, and we will get you a book. Uh, these books certainly help our study. They're... they're uh, only in addition to studying the Bible, they don't replace any of the Bible. And certainly we are always looking uh, at the text, uh, maybe even as opposed to the, some of the commentary um, in, in the book, even though the commentary uh, uh, most of the time uh, is right on. But before we have our class today, as we do in Sunday school, uh, you know, and in Sunday school we always have a period of time right at the first where we talk about those of our number who are sick or those who might be uh, uh, going to be out of town or whatever, uh, but we have a time to talk about those folks, and we don't do that here because we don't have everybody to, to supply that information, um, but we do that in Sunday school, and we do have prayer as a way of starting our class, and, and I intend to do that. Sometimes, uh, as forgetful as I'm getting, I, I maybe fail to do that, but uh, let us bow together in prayer right now. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day and for uh, the beauty of this commonwealth that we live in. We're thankful for the spring of the year and, and the beautiful flowers that bloom, the trees that bloom, and we're thankful, so thankful for a pleasant place to live. Heavenly Father, we ask that you be with this country now as we battle this COVID virus and, and help it not to, to take lives, but help people to be able to recover quickly, help the incident rate to go down so our lives can return to normal, so we can come back to our buildings to worship so we can go back to work, so our families can gather, so we can meet and enjoy one another's company also. Heavenly Father, we ask that you bless our community here, bless this congregation. Heavenly Father, help us to have good health, help us to be able to work, and help us to be a people who desire to do your will for us as we live here on the earth. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for Christ, and we're thankful for the example he set and we're thankful for this opportunity to study about him and, 
and how he fits into to our life uh, frame because he does fit into everyone's life. Uh, he has a role to play in, in our lives as we attempt to find uh, heaven uh, for eternity when this life is over. And we certainly can find that in the New Testament, in the Bible, and we would ask that you would help us to, to dig and to make sure that we're on that, on that course as we go through this life. Heavenly Father, again, we ask you uh, bless our children, uh, bless uh, all of us as we uh, attempt to work in, in just the near future, if we're not now, uh, and help things to go as well uh, for us personally as it can um, as we go through this difficult time uh, in, in our society. For this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. We are on page 271 in the book, and this lesson is entitled, The, Be the Better Covenant. So I think uh, when, you ha when you have a lesson entitled The Better Covenant, you need to think about having uh, a covenant that's better than what? Well, in, in this lesson, we are talking about uh, the first covenant uh, that, that came, and, and Mosaic, the Mosaical Law is what it was called. Uh, Moses got the law uh, on the mountain, and the people uh, worshipped God according to that law uh, right down to the finest detail. You know, the, the Pharisees, uh, the scribes, the people that were knowledgeable about the Mosaical Law uh, really drew out the points and, and made it a very precise um, provision that God had for man. And, and we know that it was intended uh, to, to live um, or to be in existence for a number of years, uh, but that it was not going to be in existence forever as it, as it would be to stand alone. It would be replaced by the better covenant. And the better covenant was brought to earth uh, as Christ came to earth. And as Christ came and, and uh, uh, lived every day so that the total of his life um, in terms of sin was perfection. He had no sin. And so uh, God's better covenant uh, was, was um, uh, had, had as its high point Christ's uh, death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, it had certainly his teachings from, from the Sermon on the Mount and all the other times that he taught in the three and a half years of his ministry. Really, his ministry went back even further than that. You know, we, we know he debated with the, the elder uh, folks in the temple even when he was just a child. Uh, and so he brought uh, God's will to man and, and demonstrated it to man over his uh, some 33 or 4 years of life here. But we're going to look at today why the, uh, the second covenant, the better covenant, uh, was put in place and why it was better than the first covenant. You know, I want to make a couple of comments here and then we're going to read the text uh, and then, then we're going to discuss, uh, we would say, the finer points of it. But a uh, couple of things that we haven't talked about very much since we've been doing Sunday school like this. And one is how much I appreciate the help that I get from all the people in our class. And you know, there's nobody here in our class today. Uh, we're trying to live within the guidelines. And, uh, and so I don't hear that. But people do email me. We get phone calls. Uh, I bump into people once in a while who say, did you ever think about this or that? And all of that is why Sunday school is so good, uh, especially good when we can have everyone here at the building and we can talk about these ideas and everyone can bring their ideas uh, to the forefront or at least have the opportunity to do that as we study here. So if you have comments you'd like to make or just, uh, just give us a call. 622-5054 uh, is the home number uh, and we're there most of the time uh, and we would answer your uh, phone call and be happy to discuss any of these issues uh, with you. You know, one of the things that's been brought to my attention since we started studying this lesson you know, we've studied about how Christ was better than the angels and, and how Christ is our high priest and, and how um, Christ is, is the very best effort that God could give us in terms of what to be sacrificed for our sins. Uh, and that was his perfect son on, on the cross. But um, as we've studied all that, as we've thought about that, uh, someone made the point to me that we are now in the, in the last days of Jerusalem as the great and powerful city it was, you know, it, it would fall to, to Roman occupation in A.D. 70. So this might have been written in the 60s even. Uh, so the people were uh, 
uh, had already under siege, maybe. They certainly were, were under threat of, of not being a powerful city anymore. As a matter of fact, millions, maybe millions, but uh, lots of people died. Um, you know, the, uh, the uh, teachings in Matthew, and we're not going to go into that because it gets to be kind of, kind of controversial, but, but a lot of those teachings about hoping that it didn't come in the winter and hoping that it didn't come when, when mothers had small children, um, uh, we think or it appears to be about, about the time of, of the uh, Roman occupation, uh, the, finally the Roman siege of Jerusalem. So I make all that point to say that uh, I'm sure there was a lot of uh, intensity about being loyal to the, to, we would say the Jewish church or to the, to the church or, or to the religious organization that existed prior to the church being established um, in, in the A.D. 30s there. And so there's a lot of pressure on those people, especially people that had authority and, and uh, people who, who were sort of of high rank uh, in the religious authority of the day to be loyal, to stay loyal to their high priest, to recognize the high priest, to recognize the priests. Um, so when, when Christianity came and, and allowed me to say replaced all of that with Christianity, where, where every Christian could be a priest and every uh, uh, person had the opportunity to, to, to study outright and to be loyal uh, to God and to consider uh, Jesus Christ as their high priest and as our mediator. So that, I think that's a, that's a really good point. This wasn't just sort of random teaching about how Christianity was better than the Mosaical Law, but, but this was teaching that was very timely uh, given what the environmental influences were uh, of, uh, of other governments in place and people trying uh, to, to uh, do away with uh, not so much maybe the Mosaical Law, but certainly the city of Jerusalem. Um, the, Bible, the, uh, the author here in Hebrews 8 makes it very clear that both laws were important. You know, the Mosaical Law existed for hundreds of years and provided a very... Uh, a, uh, a very prescribed and stern uh, law by which the people could live. You know, it provided for things like circumcision. It provided for feast days. Uh, it had lots of stipulations that the people by this time uh, had, had uh, learned to follow. And, uh, and maybe uh, for the most part, uh, most folks who were in the Mosaical Law uh, were loyal to it. And, that, and so Christ came. And, and was sacrificed on the cross for us, lived his perfect example, became the mediator for mankind, and established Christianity, established the church. Uh, the New Testament puts in place all those things uh, that we live by, uh, allow me to say loyally, uh, or, or we, and I know uh, everyone attempts to, to study the Bible and, and to, to follow uh, God's teaching uh, as we go through this life, and, uh, and you know, we don't do that uh, very well. Sometimes we do it better than others, but we always need to be striving to do that. And then finally, the last point I would make in general is that we're going to talk about this lesson from, from the standpoint of, um, of everyone recognizing that Christ lived a perfect example, lived a perfect life here on earth. You know, he, does that mean he didn't quarrel with people? No, he quarreled occasionally because it was necessary. Uh, he, you know, he had, uh, he had answers to people who accused him of things. It was not that he was a quiet and shy or bashful uh, person. It was not that he fled from opportunities to preach. As a matter of fact, he looked for opportunities in that three and a half years to, to be able to speak to large numbers of people. Um, you know, he, uh, he was very encouraging to people. And for the most part, uh, he, he had... Uh, a good following, one that uh, would allow him to, to teach for long periods of time, and, and he did that. But then finally, uh, Christ made the ultimate sacrifice, you know, and he didn't, he didn't teach for years like a lot of uh, ministers we have now. A lot, you know, he, he didn't have the opportunity to do that, but just this relatively short period of time, he did make his, his stay for, for uh, perfection in his life, for the opportunity to set the church up in perfection. And it wouldn't, uh, we know it would have troubles. Um, the apostles met after the church was established and talked about different issues. 
but we know how the church embraced everybody, uh, Jews and Gentiles. Uh, it, it was put in place uh, to be for an eternity also, uh, just like we intend to be uh, in eternity in heaven ourselves. So this lesson is about why the people should cling to the new law, should cling to the, to the better covenant uh, and look at the old covenant historically and, and what it uh, did for the new covenant, why it was put in place and why it was necessary. But um, we're going to just read the text. This is, I believe it's the whole chapter of Hebrews 8. And then I want to go over there and look at the, um, at the discussion questions. You know, we've been talking about the other questions, but I think the discussion questions here especially kind of uh, bring out the high points of, of what the Hebrew author was teaching these people uh, about Christ and his life as the, the, uh, the linchpin of the better covenant. So we're going to talk about why uh, the, the last law was the better law and why those people needed to cling to it. You know, as a way of thinking about that, I want to read two verses just very quickly right at the beginning and allow, allow yourself to think of these verses as sort of the golden text out of Hebrews 8. Hebrews 8, 1 says, Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated, seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. And then, uh, just if you'll turn your book over, if you have one, but the last verse of, of the 18th, or the 8th uh, chapter says, And in that he says, A new covenant. He has made the first obsolete now what, is, now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. So he's talking about this new covenant um, that's so important, was put in place by God, who made Christ the high priest, uh, and, and then who provided a place for heaven to be created for all of us, or to be for all of us uh, as we go through this life. And then finally, um, this new covenant makes the old covenant uh, educational, but, but it makes it something that is vanishing away. Okay, now, uh, I'll go back here. Let me just start again, and I'm going to just read the whole text, and then we'll come back and look at the main points. Now, this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary, and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected, and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore it is necessary that, that this one who also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and swallow, and, I'm sorry, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant which was established on better promises. So this is description of the better covenant uh, that, that God has put in place to replace the Mosaic law uh, which the people had been so committed to over the past even centuries. Verse 7 says, For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I have made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. And in that he says, a new covenant he has made, the first obstacle, 
now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. So the first of, the, of our scripture says that, that God has provided for us a high, a high priest who came from heaven, who, who came and lived perfectly on earth, and who was to bring a better covenant uh, with his life and teaching. And then finally it says that and that new teaching or that new covenant will eventually make the old covenant, the, the first covenant, obsolete, growing old, and ready to vanish away. I think that's interesting that it says that it was, uh, it was ready to, to, to vanish away. It wasn't, didn't, didn't say that it was all gone, but it was a place where they could teach about the better covenant and the, the Mosaical law would then become educational, uh, but, but not uh, technically binding, we would say, as the people learned about uh, what God used the old covenant for and, and, and what he intended the new covenant to do. So let's look at the questions on, on, uh, over here on page 277. And again, we're going to start down here. And, and I'll tell you how I came to, about thinking about this. I thought in reading that text that there were several questions that they didn't really approach much uh, in our 10 short answer questions. So I started kind of making my questions up. And then all of a sudden, I noticed in the discussion questions, they pretty much did describe the, the text we'd been reading and ask questions that were pertinent uh, to that. So um, the first question says, why is recognition of type and antitype usage helpful for readers of the Bible? Define type and antitype as completely as you can. Now, you know, type and antitype uh, are interesting terms, and you don't, uh, at least I haven't studied much about them in literature otherwise, but in this looking at, in, in Hebrews 8, uh, the type is what occurred uh, in the Old Testament. And you know, just take for instance, uh, you know, we often refer to Christ as, um, as symbolic of King David, or uh, that Christ was, uh, Christ was like Elijah the prophet, or we talked about the, uh, the uh, in the text, it talked about the serpent that was put uh, on a rod into the air uh, when the Israelites were on the, uh, the, uh, in the wilderness there looking for the promised land, trying to get to the promised land, uh, and that was their way of salvation. So that was another way of Christ being presented to them, uh, even though it wasn't Christ, it was something symbolic of Christ. Now that was the type. The type was what was put in place uh, to remind us of something that would come later, and what would come later uh, is what they call the antitype. And the antitype is, is what, uh, in the New Covenant, God was, was working toward. You know, I, I just made a note to myself here about that question. And I think uh, the real important thing to remember is uh, that the plan of salvation has been in, in uh, God's mind since man has been in God's mind. You know, in, in, the, uh, in the chapters of uh, early Genesis, Genesis 1 and, and following there, you know, we have the, the uh, beginnings of the plan of salvation. And so God knew that Christ was going to come and live a perfect life and that he was going to die for our sins. And so he could relate that uh, as, as history unfolded across the Old Testament. And so that would be what would eventually be the first covenant where man would do many things, uh, some of them good and some of them bad, um, and, and many of them could certainly be identified as a type, and then those events happen uh, later on in, in ways that brought the church into being, that brought the new covenant into being. So um, that's, it says define type and antitype as completely as you can. You know, I think that as few words as we could say is that you know, the, the type events or people or places or circumstances were all things that would remind us of something that would happen in the New Testament and that would really uh, be part of the plan of salvation. You know, most of them would be, excuse me, that, uh, most of, of those things would be about Christ. Uh, but uh, they could be, they could, there could be other things that had to do with the church uh, and with the plan of salvation that would be an anti-type also. But it's really interesting if you just look at the, the details um, 
you know, some even in the, in the uh, 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 first five books of the Old Testament, or if you looked at the, the prophets or minor prophets, you see places uh, that refer to, to events or, uh, or um, uh, locations that, that became the, uh, the site of events uh, that pertain to Christ and pertain to the church, really, even though it would be hundreds of years before the church would come into existence. Question two in our discussion question says, for what purpose did the author of Hebrews argue that a place was sought for a second covenant and what happened to the first? So let me just, uh, let's just turn over, back over here to the text a little bit and begin with verse seven there where it says, if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. So when it became obvious that the first covenant was not going to, to be faultless, was not going to provide for the salvation of man, uh, then, then God saw that we needed a second covenant. Now, um, God understood that, and, and uh, as a matter of fact, I believe Christ understood that uh, as well, and he was the place, the person, uh, the faultless life uh, that made um, dying on the cross uh, not just important but necessary for the salvation of man. Let me go ahead and read um, verse 8. It says, because finding fault with them, he says, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them out by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. So that was the place and the purpose for which the new covenant uh, came into existence. Question three says, in what respects is the new covenant superior when compared to the old covenant God made with Israel? You know, that's a, that's a really interesting question and one that I made uh, notes about. Um, the uh, the uh, new covenant was certainly superior because it contained Christ and Christianity and the church uh, as, as its outcome. It provided heaven as an outcome for people. You know, the old covenant was, was good. It provided a way for priests uh, and high priests to get uh, man's sins uh, before God, not forgiven, uh, but pushed forward. Uh, it was a way that allowed man to, to, to strengthen the moral side of his life uh, and certainly uh, those, those people did, many of them, um, you know, just, uh, just very moral lives as they went through here, but uh, it did not have a way of getting man's sins forgiven like the second covenant did. Um, when Christ was willing to come, leave heaven, live a perfect life in front of man, uh, among men, uh, and then die on the cross to be resurrected, to go back to heaven uh, and have us be able to, to learn about his life his example and how our life should as close as we can mimic his life. Um, that would be the, the primary way that the new covenant was better than the old covenant. Now, question four might have uh, been better off as the first question. It says, what is a covenant? Describe the covenant God had established with his people in, the, in Christ. How is, the old, how is it like the old covenant? How is it different? Okay, so, so what is a covenant? Well, a, a covenant is a, is a promise. It's an agreement. It's, uh, and I think we would often say it's an agreement among people who want to, uh, to come to an agreement. You know, we, we try to make uh, laws in society today that we call covenants, uh, where people agree to certain terms and others agree to certain terms, uh, and then we keep that covenant. Well, uh, this question says, how does the covenant God established with his people in Christ? Well, what did God do? God sent Christ from heaven where, where he uh, had everything anybody, if that's the correct term, could want. Uh, he, he allowed him to come to earth, to, to live among men, to live a perfect life among men, and then to die on the cross, and then to be resurrected. Now, we know that God said then that he makes a place for us, and if we want to be where Christ is forever, then, then we have to be obedient that's our side of the covenant. God provided his son. Uh, we must be obedient to his son. 
the new covenant. Uh, and in, when we do that, then we have um, the opportunity. We can be in heaven with Christ forever. And I think we, uh, you know, most of us, as soon as we're able to understand uh, life very much at all, we understand the idea of it being eternal. You know, I, nobody ever says this very much, but uh, we are in eternal life right now. We are in eternal life right now. Uh, because when uh, we live, leave this life, uh, we continue our life either in, in heaven or in hell. And so that's why we study, is to try to know uh, what God wants for us. Uh, and, and, and that's why we have Sunday school on Sunday morning and sometimes on other periods of time in the week. The last part of that question says, how is it like the old covenant and how is it different? Well, uh, the... Let's just cut right to the chase because we have these other questions we want to get to just quickly. Um, you know, the, the old covenant was really good. Uh, it really added discipline to people's lives. It allowed them to be governable, I think, in a, in a kind of a, in a way that was difficult. It's hard for us to, you know, sometimes it's hard to govern. Uh, we could just ask our mayor and, and judge executive. Sometimes it's hard to govern uh, 20,000 people, you know, let alone the millions that... that um, the, uh, that Moses and then later leaders had to, had to take with uh, the Jews. So, but the Old Covenant made them more governable and certainly a better people, uh, but it did not have salvation uh, at the end of it. It did not have Christ um, as, as part of, of the, the, the Old Covenant, at least in terms of the winding up of the Old Covenant, because as Christ came, he was seeding or he put in place Christianity that the people would live with um, going forward uh, with the hope of, of eternity. So the old covenant was good. It just did not have um, the, the long-term ramifications that Christianity did and was not the end of the plan of salvation um, that, that, that Christ brought here when he established uh, the church, uh, when Christianity uh, began to flourish. You know, um, you just think about that, how many Christians you know in 2,000 years ago uh, there wouldn't have been any, so it's, uh, certainly it has its ups and downs, but, but it's uh, been strong, and if we'll work harder, it'll be stronger. Now, let's just go back here very quickly, and I think I'm getting pretty far along in our time, but I want to just look at these questions very quickly and, and um, try to reinforce this point uh, that they needed uh, to recognize the better covenant uh, because it had within it uh, Christ's death, and the establishment of the church. Where in the New Testament, in addition to Hebrews, is type, anti-type interpretation helpful? Well, the, the Bible uh, makes reference to, to um, or the New Testament makes reference to John 3.14, where we have the example of the, the serpent where the people had sinned, and that was their way of, of getting forgiveness um, and allowed their life to continue. In what sense is the Mosaic Covenant a type of the New Covenant God has made with those who believe Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ? Well, I've just made a note here that says all the events um, in the, uh, in, in the um, Mosaic Law that describe uh, the, the covenant uh, become events in the life of Christ or in the establishment of the church. Uh, so... Uh, in what sense is the Mosaic Covenant a type of the New Covenant? Well, uh, you know, we could go back into to all the details of, of the Mosaic Law and, and uh, even the sacrifices they made and, and um, you know, circumcision and, and all the things they had to do to, to, to be in good standing uh, in, the, in the old law. Well, we go, go over to the New uh, Covenant and you find out that there are things that we have to do to be in good standing uh, with the new law, you know, and, and uh, you know, we could talk about uh, baptism, or we could talk about uh, living a, a Christian life beyond that. Uh, you know, we've uh, we've not talked much about uh, in Sunday school here, at least, about how uh, you know you don't uh, you don't just uh, put on Christ uh, in baptism, but you continue to live in Christ um, as as a Christian, and so that was important, just as it was important that they did certain things. Uh, type and anti-type, uh, the, the old covenant with the new. Question three says, where has the Christian's high priest been seated? 
at the right hand of God. That was that first verse, I believe, uh, which just simply uh, states his authority. Who erected the true tabernacle in the heavens? God did. God did. What prevented Jesus from being a high priest on earth? Well, the most uh, basic thing was that he was from the wrong tribe. You know, the, the, uh, the high priests were, were Levites, and, and he was of the tribe of Judah. What did the author of Hebrews mean when he said the gifts offered according to the law were the copy and shadow of heavenly things? Well, this is a, this is a description um, of the type and, and anti-type. This is a description of, of the things that were put out there that would be, uh, ha have their uh, facsimile, if you will, or something similar uh, in Christianity. And, uh, and we could talk about different parts that, that made up the, the, uh, the gifts offered uh, and see where they came over into the, to the church or into the New Testament. Uh, and when they did, when they became something similar, they became the antitype uh, over in the, old, in the uh, New Testament. In what capacity is Jesus able to serve the better covenant, which is built on better promises? You know, he, he is able to, to show us a life that was perfection. You know, what, uh, in one of the earlier lessons, they said, what did Christ have to offer? Well, he had to serve as the better covenant, the perfect life that allowed him to be the mediator for us. Just as we, we had the prayer at the beginning of class, you know, we pray in Christ's name because that's how we can bring our, our repentance uh, before God now. Uh, it's how we can bring our desires uh, before God now uh, because Christ was able to do that. You know, just a, an aside to that, um, you know, Christ lived a perfect life on earth because he made the decisions to do that. He didn't just come here and God said, now I'm going to make you live a perfect life. That He had to be able to make uh, those decisions, and he did. And that's why, among other reasons, that the better covenant was the second covenant or the one that he brought as he established the church. What did God promise through Jeremiah he would make with the house of Israel and the house of Judah in the last days? Well, he promised a new covenant, and we would go ahead and say now a better covenant, a Christ-filled covenant, uh, the church-based uh, uh, covenant or a covenant that had the church in it as the way of, of gaining heaven uh, for, for people both before and after Christ. But he promised a new covenant, one that was based on the perfect life of Christ and one that provided the church for us. Where did God promise he would put his laws when he established a new covenant? In the hearts and minds of Christians. So you know, we, we talk a lot about, uh, about things that they did with the spiritual law and, and with the, uh, or with the uh, first covenant. You know, they had um, uh, uh, feast days and they had circumcision and, and they had lots of things where they kept the ideas of the, of the old covenant or the, uh, the first covenant. But the new covenant was to be stored, if you will, or, or kept in the hearts and minds of Christians as they work every day uh, to, to establish Christ's heart in their own heart by putting the new covenant there. Question 10 says, who would you know the Lord, who would know the Lord when God established a new covenant between himself and humankind? I think if we look back over there, if we look at what was um, stated in Jeremiah and then what it says in our text, is that everyone, everyone would know the new covenant. Um, and that's really important because who do we want to uh, see in heaven? We want to see everyone in heaven. We want everyone to be aware of what God did for us, that Christ uh, didn't have to live a perfect life, but he did. He didn't have to die on the cross, uh, but he did. That was part of the plan of salvation, and, and he understood that, even as difficult as it would be for a person to face uh, death on the cross and then to be resurrected to be back in heaven with God, to be there to establish uh, a home for us uh, for eternity. So uh, God had a plan, the plan of salvation. The plan of salvation had the, the first covenant that did a lot for mankind, for, did a lot for how they lived here on earth and certainly made them 
uh, more reverent uh, toward God as they went through life, but it wasn't perfect, and it wouldn't get man uh, into heaven, uh, but the second covenant would, or the better covenant would, uh, because of Christ and his perfection. As always, it's been a, uh, an honor, joy to, to be able to speak with you, and if you have questions or comments, uh, just be sure and give me a call, and if uh, you, you give me a call and I can remember, I'll, uh, I'll bring your comments to class next Sunday. Bye-bye. As I travel through life with its trouble and strife, I've a glorious hope to give cheer on the way. Soon my toll will be o'er, and I'll rest on that shore where the night has been turned into day. Up in the beautiful paradise valley by the side of the river of, river of life. Up in the valley, the wonderful valley will be free from all pain and all strife. There we shall live in the rose-tinted garden, neath the shade of the evergreen, evergreen tree. How I long for the paradise valley, paradise valley where the beauty of heaven all seven I'll see. As I roam the hillside, or I list to the tide, as I pluck the sweet flowers that grow in the dale, a faint picture is there of a land bright and fair, where perennial flowers ne'er fail. Up in the beautiful paradise valley, by the side of the river of river of life. Up in the valley, the wonderful valley will be free from all pain and all strain and all strife. There we shall live in the rose tinted garden, neath the shade of the evergreen, evergreen tree. How I long for the paradise valley, paradise valley, where the beauty of heaven, of heaven I'll see. Though your garden is rare, it is not to compare with the flowers that bloom in the garden above. In the midst of it grows, Sharon's perfect sweet rose, tis the wonderful flower we love. Up in the beautiful paradise valley, by the side of the river, the river of life. Up in the valley, the wonderful valley, will be free from all pain and all strain and all strife. There we shall live in the rose-tinted garden, neath the shade of the evergreen, evergreen tree. How I long for the paradise valley, paradise valley, where the beauty of heaven, of heaven I'll see. Good morning. We're glad to have everybody with us again today for worship services. Uh, you know, it's uh, becoming a kind of a routine thing. I don't know if that's good or bad, but uh, I know I sure miss gathering with people and fellowshipping with one another, and I look forward to that day when we'll be able to do that again. We want to thank Brother Wilson for the lesson this morning and his study in Hebrews, and we hope you enjoyed that and uh, plan on being with us next Sunday as, we continue, as he continues that study. We've got a few announcements this morning and then we'll get right into our, our worship. Uh, we're saddened to announce that Brother Billy Bishop passed away last Saturday. There was a private graveside service for him at the Bethany Church of Christ. And that's where he attended mostly, but he had attended here with us on Wednesday evenings in particular and even led singing for us for a time. And, He'll be missed here, and we need to remember that family as well as his good friend, Betty Graves, who attended here with him, and uh, we need to remember them. And there will be a celebration of life service held at a later date uh, at the Bethany Church of Christ. We, uh, we do have a few sick that we wanted to announce. Uh, Delford Johnson is home. He is recovering and doing better, I understand. Uh, he and Wanda both need our prayers, though, and we need to continue to re remember them. Uh, I, I know Brother Sean told me that he saw 
Toby out mowing, so we know that Toby's doing better, and we're glad of that. Um, we're glad he was able to recover for that as quickly as he as he did. We would encourage any of you at any time to reach out to Terry here and let her know of any sick or anything that you may need, and we'll be glad to try to help accommodate that and um, be willing to help out any way that we could. Now, a few other announcements real quick. Of course, this service starts at 10 this morning, and also this afternoon, uh, Jimmy Allen will be doing a class. It's geared toward the high school group, but I'm sure he'd be welcome any viewers that would like to watch. It's at 5 o'clock on Sunday evenings. And then Brother Randy will be doing a Bible study on Wednesday evenings at 6.30. So all those are on YouTube or Facebook, and uh, we encourage you to, to join those. Um, the Secret Sisters who want to drop off their gifts can put them on the library table, and, I, and they will be passed on to who they need to be. Uh, you can bring them up any time. Uh, or, or, or you can pick them up, or you can, br you can just bring them the next time we meet, whichever way you would like to do. Uh, there, there is going to be an uh, unusual, everybody's adjusting to the situation we're in, but uh, we're, we're really happy for Shelby Harper, who attends here, and uh, she is marrying Bo Lane. Uh, they are going to have a shower for her here at the building April 26th but it's gonna be a virtual shower. So the way that'll work, if you've sent your gift to Shelby or if you have a gift for her, you could drop it off here at the building and then uh, they're gonna record her, the family is record her opening those and you can view it online just like we're viewing this service. I think that's all we have this morning. Uh, we're uh, once again very grateful that you're here with us this morning and. We hope that you enjoy our service and, uh, and worship the Lord together. Uh, Brother Randy will be bringing the message. Uh, and at this time, if you'll bow with me, I'll lead us in a prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the love of Jesus and so thankful for your many blessings. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for our church family and what it means to each of us. And we pray that you will continue to be with us and bless us here. And Heavenly Father, help us all to get through this time. And we're looking forward to the time when we can come back here and worship you together. Heavenly Father, we're mindful of all those that are sick and especially of our number, be with Brother Delford and Wanda and be with others that are, may have a, some struggle or that are shut in or whatever the case may be. And we pray that you would be with them and comfort them. Heavenly Father, we ask you be with the family of Brother Bishop, be with Betty Graves and be with them as, as they lost Brother Billy, and we pray that they would look to you and that you would bless them and that whatever little we can do, we could do and support them and that you would bless them and comfort them. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this country we live in, the freedoms that we have. We pray that you would be with all those that are, that are dealing with this epidemic and be with them and keep them safe. And we pray that you would bless those that have the virus. And if it be thy will, recover them to their health. And we pray for the time when our country's back open and that we're able to all get out and go about our business and see one another again. And we pray for that time to be soon, Heavenly Father. And but be with us now while we're, while we're uh, trying to get through this. We know that people are lonely and people are in their homes and we pray that you would be with everyone, whatever their need may be, and be with them and, 
and comfort them. Heavenly Father, we ask you to be with all of us here that are worshiping now together. We know that you're in our presence, and we pray that we would do things according to your will. Be with Brother Randy this morning, and we're thankful for the Bible and the lesson that Brother Wilson brought to us, and pray that you would just continue to be with us and bless us. Heavenly Father, we're most thankful for your Son. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, greetings, and hope that all is going well with you. If you have your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. We're going to return to that book. I skipped it last week, but we're, we're coming back and spending some time on it today. I appreciate all of you who watch these videos. I, I know it doesn't measure up to being together, it, it, and, but we will soon. We will soon. Uh, the interesting thing is, is how many people are watching these videos, and I appreciate everybody watching it, and if you would, share it. Who knows what good that can do? Well, Jimmy Allen has been teaching his uh, teenage class. Now, Jimmy, whenever he gets an opportunity, he set, tells the church, now, I teach the teenage class, and then he says, but anybody is welcome to come to it that wants to come to it. He says that every time. But anyway, if, uh, if you look at his Bible class for the young people, you'll see that around 100 people at least, that was early in the week, had already viewed it. So Jimmy is getting his wish. He's teaching the teenagers and he's getting a bigger audience than that. And that's good because he's a good teacher. He's probably one of the most knowledgeable uh, people of the Bible that I that I know, and so that's something for you to look at as well. In in Romans chapter four, it says, "For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith." Now I, I want us to think about this, and and I'm not going into the fact that we're not under the old, uh, old law as much as maybe I normally would. That's, that's not the focus of, of what Paul is saying here as much as he is. He's emphasizing the importance of faith. And that's what I really want to emphasize uh, in this lesson. But it is important for us to know this phrase, the righteousness of faith, the righteousness that comes by faith, or it comes through faith. You see, we emphasize, and it just kind of tickles me thinking about it, we, we emphasize obedience, and we should, because the Bible emphasizes obedience, but we just we keep coming back to it, keep coming back to it to the point that we neglect faith or trust in God. You, you rarely hear sermons that are really stressing that as much as you do sermons about obedience. Now, obedience is important, but it, it's, it's kind of like, I, I was thinking about, a, about an old fellow that was known to, no matter where he was in the Bible, he was always preaching on baptism, and so the elders had a talk with him, and they said, look, we appreciate that you, you talk about baptism, and we believe in baptism and, and its importance, but says, we really think that you need to get away from that and preach on other subjects besides baptism. And, and he said, well, what would you want me to preach on? And they said, well, go to Genesis. Go to Genesis and preach on God creating this beautiful world. And so the preacher gets up on Sunday morning, and he starts off talking about and God created the heavens and the earth, and he gets on down to where God creates the ocean, and the next thing you know, he says, that brings, you to my, that brings me to my subject of baptism today. Okay, we kind of do that with talking about obedience. We're afraid that somebody's going to hear us say that all you got to do is believe, and, and you don't have to obey. Well, obviously, we don't want people to go away thinking that you don't have to obey. 
if it just makes common sense that if you want to be a child of God, you want to be an obedient, faithful child of God, a child that's interested in living right, don't we? But in doing that, we're not saying enough about our trust in the Father. And I want, I want to deal with that today. Because we are not made righteous by our own good deeds. We, we, we want to live a righteous life. We want to try to do righteous things. But we know, if we're being honest at all, that our righteousness is not enough because we are all unrighteous. And so we need the righteousness which comes by faith. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, this is, that's gospel, by the way. But uh, read Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 11. That's my favorite section on this particular issue. But anyway, verse 14. For it is the, uh, for if it is the inheritance of the law who are to be heirs, faith is null and void, and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. Now whenever we hear the word law, read the word law in the Bible, we automatically think of the Old Testament law. And that's, that's what I want to go with. We, we know that we're not under the Mosaical law. And I'm glad. For one thing, I'm glad we don't have to offer animal sacrifices anymore. I'm glad that Jesus offered himself once for all. His, his sacrifice was greater than all the animal sacrifices in the world. It did what they couldn't do. It, it, it brought complete salvation. But anyway, I'm glad that we're no longer on the, the Levitical priestly system. I'm glad that every child of God is a priest of God, that we're a nation of priests. I'm, I'm grateful for all of that. I'm also grateful that I don't have to believe for one minute that I have to keep the law perfectly in order to go to heaven. I believe that a sinner can be saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. That's where we are. That's what I want you to see. Because it, in, in trying to be conservative, which that's a great word and, and a great thing to be, in trying to be conservative and emphasizing obedience, if we're not very careful, we end up making the gospel sound like law. And that gets you back to your, your trusting in your ability to keep the law rather than trusting what Jesus accomplished on the cross. If we're not very careful, we'll get like that fellow that went up on the rooftop to pray and stood up and lifted up his eyes to the heaven and started telling God how good he was and how he had kept this law and kept that law and how he was glad that he wasn't like other people and he starts pointing to the tax collector who was over here uh, standing off to the side and, and he's ashamed to lift up his head and he certainly isn't go going to tell God how good he is. But if we're not careful in trusting in our obedience, that's what we become like. We get to comparing ourselves to other people and, and thinking, well, whew, at least I'm better than them. Or we can do what the Pharisees did. Not all of our Pharisees were bad, but there were a lot of bad Pharisees who trusted that they were righteous. Okay, we, we don't want to turn the gospel message into the law in which we have to keep everything perfectly because we, we haven't been able to do that, folks. <clears throat> we were not able to keep the law before we were baptized. We were not able to be, we're not able to keep the law, if you will, after our baptism. We're not able to live perfectly before our baptism. We're not able to live perfectly after our baptism. Folks, we have to trust in the atoning death of Jesus Christ for our salvation. There are a lot of good Christian people, and by that I mean people that are all about obeying but they're so honest and, and, and sincere that they know inside that they have sin and they're scared to death that they're going to be lost. It is because you're trusting in the wrong thing. You're trusting in your performance and not trusting in your Savior. 
Jesus came to save sinners. And that includes you. He can save you. And for us to doubt his ability to save us is an insult to God. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. We have heard that verse so many times that we have misused it in our minds so many times that we are automatically thinking obedience there and that is part of it because true faith produces obedience. But without faith, it is impossible to please God means you've got to trust God. You've got to trust God and his provision for your salvation, his provision for your forgiveness of fin, sins, and when you do that, you're going to live a faithful life. You're going to be obedient, but you know all along that you don't trust in your obedience. You trust in the Father who made a promise, and it's an insult for you to doubt his promise how can you be a friend to God if you don't trust him? Why would he, be, why would he consider you a friend if you don't trust him? I mean, after all, he has proven himself forever without question to be faithful to all that he says. Now he goes on and he says, verse, I'll read verse 14 again. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be theirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith. Now again, I caution you, when you read the word faith, don't just automatically think of obedience. That's part of it. That's a result of it. But it begins with the trust in God in order that the promise may rest on grace. That's unearned favor of God. You didn't earn it before your baptism. You didn't earn it after your baptism. Salvation is a gift from God through faith in Jesus Christ. And be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham. Now he comes back to Abraham. Now, remember in chapter 4, back in verse 1 and 2, we found out that Abraham, as good as he was, never could walk up to God and say, you owe me salvation, neither can we. So we got to have the faith of Abraham, which means we're dependent upon God. He says, okay, we are the ones who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I've made you the father of many nations in the presence of God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence things that do not exist. Now, I love that. We're talking about a God who created everything from nothing. He's powerful. He is able to do things that, that we can't even imagine. My favorite, my favorite text on this, or sermon or whatever, uh, and I actually shared it on Facebook on Thursday because it's just such a beautiful passage. It's an old African-American preacher by the name of S.M. Lockridge, so if you can look that up sometime and see clips of his sermon. But S.M. Lockridge had a fellow that came up to him uh, come up to him and said, where did God come from? And he said, God came from nowhere. And the, pre the fellow says, well, now that doesn't make any sense at all. Let's, let's deal with that. And so this is him telling about his response to that fellow. First of all, he says, if, if you will trust him, he will be as trustworthy to you as he was to Abraham when Abraham went out not knowing where he was going. When heaven and earth were yet unmade, when there was empty blackness and formlessness and darkness was on the face of the deep, when time was unknown, thou in thy bliss and thou in thy majesty did live. He called light out of darkness. He called chaos, cosmos out of chaos. He called order out of confusion. But the question remains, where did he come from? The answer is, he came from nowhere. The reason God came from nowhere is there was nowhere for him to come from. 
And coming from nowhere, he stood on nothing. And the reason he stood on nothing, there was nowhere for him to stand. And standing on nothing, he reached out where there was nowhere to reach and caught something when there was nothing to catch and hung something on nothing and told it to stay there. And standing on nothing, he took the anvil of his own will and struck the anvil of his omnipotence and sparks flew and he caught them on his fingers and flung them into heavens and bedecked the heavens with, with jewels and nobody said a word. And the reason nobody said a word was there was no one to say anything. And so God himself said, that's good. And God has chosen Christ, the name that is above every name, so that every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God and Father. Just an absolutely beautiful word picture of the God who is eternal. The God who called things into existence that were not. That's who we're talking about trusting. He has power. He has knowledge. He has love. And he has love for you. And what did Abraham do? It says that he trusted the one who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Now listen to this. If you Please read along with me. In, in Romans chapter 4, verse 18, I, I'm just going to work through the rest of this, this beautiful passage. And hope he believed against hope, that he should become the father of many nations as he had been told. So shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb, no belief made him waver. I love the King James there where it says, he staggered not at the promises of God. But he grew strong in his faith. Now just get the picture. Now, When God said to Abraham, leave your home country, he obeyed and went. But here's the situation where he is an old man, where he and Sarah have been married for a long, long time. They're past the age of childbearing. Uh, Sarah doesn't have the ability to conceive. That's, that's been true year after year after year. But God said, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. And since God said it, Abraham believed it. And he grew in his faith. And that's exactly what God wants to see in us. He wants to see us read his word and claim his promises. He doesn't want us to live in fear and doubt. He doesn't want us panicking in every situation. Oh, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? We're going to trust God. That's what we're going to do. That's the attitude we need. That's the way we approach life. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him, Job said. That's the way we're to live our lives. That's the way we're to think about our eternal home. Instead of being people that are scared to death, that we're always going to be lost, even though we're doing the best we can, and, and we're, we're trying as hard as we can try. We're still doubting our salvation. It's because we're not trusting what Jesus did. He paid for our sins. Now, if you're afraid that I'm leaving the impression that you can believe and that's all you have to do then, then you're wrong. I'm not going to leave that impression. Paul is not going to leave that impression. Read Romans 6. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, King James says. By the way, the word God is not in the Greek there. They're using, a, they're using a, an English idiom there. 
uh, is a better translation of what the Greek says is certainly not. No, we, we're not supposed to continue in sin. Why? Because we died to sin. When did we die to sin? When we died with Christ and was raised with Christ to walk in newness of life. So no, I'm not saying it, but please, please, let's don't jump to the obedience part and ignore the trust part. Just think about that. We, we talk, I've heard my whole life, my whole life, I've spent most of my life going to church. Most of it I've spent preaching, but I've listened to some sermons too. And we're always stressing that obedience. We're always stressing that obedience. And I'm glad, because God wants us to obey. We don't talk nearly enough about we need to trust the Father. Don't talk nearly enough about that. Because I know a bunch of people that obey and they're scared to death. It's because they don't have the trust. Abraham, he believed. God said it. He said, I'm going to take it. Now he goes on and he says, verse 21, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. I believe that he, he can do what he promises, don't you? Don't you believe when Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved? Don't you believe that? Don't you believe that if you walk as in, in the light as he's in the light, the blood of Jesus will cleanse you from all your sins? Doesn't you believe when John writes down, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins? I believe that. And I can have hope and you can have hope in eternal life. Because God said, if you do this, this is what I'll give you. We can trust him. Verse 22, that is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone. Just, it's not written just for him. It's written for us. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raise from the dead Jesus Christ our Lord. You get righteousness put on your account when you believe and trust the Father. And so when we read this, that, that well, let's just go back and read verse 21. Fully convinced that God was able to do what he promised, that is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness, but the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but our sakes. Folks, that ought to be, that section, this concept ought to be written into our hearts just like Proverbs chapter three where it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. I love that passage, you do too. Well, let's do that. Let's trust the Father. He goes on and says, it will be counted to us who believe in him and raise from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was, what, now get this, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Can God save you? Absolutely. Can you save yourself? Absolutely not. You got to depend on God's provision. And that's Jesus Christ who was delivered up for you and who was raised for your justification. If Jesus was not raised from the dead, then you and I are not justified. But if he was raised from the dead and we're in Christ and we're, we're striving to please him, then we can trust him for our forgiveness and for our justification. Now, how do you get in Christ? You know, there again, we emphasize some things and neglect some things. We need to talk about you need to believe that Jesus is the Christ. You need to believe the right things about Jesus. I mean, there are a lot of people that say they believe in Jesus, but they believe the wrong things about Jesus. You need to believe what the Bible says about Jesus, not make up stuff on your own. You need to confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And when you confess that, it needs to be a sincere confession. That needs to mean something to you. It means that you're confessing that he is to be the Lord of your life, every phase of your life. You're to repent of your sins. We neglect that when repentance, you know, and around this area, there's a, 
there's a couple of smaller denominations and they, they, they emphasize repentance and they neglect baptism, but they emphasize repentance and they, they have this thing they call the mourner's bench, within the, which isn't in the Bible, but anyway, they believe that people ought to, ought to weep and wail for their sins. If people want to weep and wail for their sins, I'm not going to stop them because repentance is a painful process. And, and it's something that is necessary to be a, be a Christian. And then, and then you, not only do you need to repent, you need to be baptized. And people go berserk and say, oh, baptism hasn't got anything to do with it. Listen, are you saved without faith? Absolutely not. Well, listen to this. For we are all children of God by faith, for as many of us as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. What is the proper faith response to the gospel message? It is believing, repenting, confessing, and being baptized into Jesus Christ. That's the faith, proper faith response, and anything less than that is not a faith. And so if you need to come to Jesus, trusting that God has provided a way for you to be saved, then you come. You call me, you call anybody at this church, you get in contact with somebody, we'll help you to become a child of God. Thank you for watching this service. O oh, thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me ever to adore Thee May I still Thy goodness prove While the hope of endless glory Fills my heart with joy and love here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I've come. And I hope by thy good pleasure, safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Never let me wander from thee, never leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. I'm going to now uh, read a little scripture and, and you can partake of the Lord's Supper now. And I'm going to tell you something. I'll be so glad when we were free uh, to go and come as we please. We have took that for granted, hadn't we? Uh, I, think, I think it's coming pretty soon in which we'll be able to get back together. I may be wrong, but that's, that's my feelings. I'm being optimistic about it. I think the president is going to turn us loose pretty quick. Uh, I'm not saying go ahead and do what you want to do. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying. Uh, but I'm going to tell you something that's, that's going to happen. Uh, you're going to realize how special it was for you to partake of the Lord's Supper with your family. I, I, I guarantee, I, I hope that you understand that's special. My wife and I have been going out to Miss Frankie's uh, every, every Sunday since all of this began. Uh, one of us or both of us, most time both of us, and, and being able to 
observe the Lord's Supper with Miss Frankie has been special, special, special. And I hope that it, I hope it's always special to you, but taking it in the home with your family, that's pretty wonderful. Isaiah 53. For he grew up like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and had no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. And we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before it shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, and they had made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him, he has put him to grief. When the soul makes an offering for guilt, he sees his offspring. He shall prolong his days. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many be accounted to righteous. Make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. Let's pray. Father, thank you for remembering us. Now please help us to remember you as we should and remember your son on the cross. Thank you for the bread, this simple, plain reminder of your son. May we partake of it in a way that is filled with meaning in our own hearts of thinking about Jesus, your son, the Christ, our Savior, and what he did. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, in like manner, <clears throat> it's strange as that came out of my mouth that we think about the words that we say and how we get into our routines and, and we develop our traditions. And as long as I can remember as a Christian, we've, I've heard people say, in like manner. And that's a good phrase, Father, because we want to partake of the cup with the same attitude and the same reverence and the same self-examination that we did when we partook of the bread. And we pray that you help us to focus upon Jesus. Thank you, Father, for the sacrifice. Thank you for this cup. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, thank you for joining us once again. Again, share it. I'm sure you have a lot of friends that uh, don't go to church with us. It seems that our number of people that are viewing this uh, has grown and continues to grow. And that I'm just, I'm just glad that people are watching. And I hope people are worshiping and gaining something from this experience. And may God bless you and keep you. 
And may we see each other face to face soon. Well, we want to thank everybody again for uh, watching this this morning. Again, we want to tell you that we've, uh, if you need any help, if you need anything, call the call Terry, call one of the elders, call Randy. We'll be happy to do anything for you that we can. But uh, sure appreciate everybody pitching in, and like we said, we appreciate Wilson doing the lesson and Randy doing his lesson and Jimmy uh, doing a midweek lesson. Bow with me, if you will. Father, we pause at this time thanking you for everything that you give us. Father, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've given to us. We thank you for the sunshine and the rain. Father, for the uh, amount of health that you have allowed us to enjoy. Father, we thank you for our homes. We thank you for our family. We thank you for our neighbors and our friends. Especially thank you for our church family. Father, we know that this country is in a time of trying to reawake. We're trying to, our leaders and lawmakers and rulers over are trying to decide when it's safe for us to go back out and to be in the public again and to be around each other more. Father, give them wisdom and guidance in all these things. And help us, Father, as we listen to them Help us to realize that they're trying and attempting to, to keep us safe. Help us to be patient with them. Help us to be patient with each other. Help us to keep our social distances until we know that this is over. But at the same time, help us use common sense to, to uh, continue to use our funds and our monies uh, to support our local businesses and to support each other the best that we can. Father, we thank you so much for your son and your, the fact that you sent him and the great examples that he lived upon this earth. Help us to emulate those examples every day, especially in this time of need. Father, help us to, to be a good neighbor and to be a good friend and to, and, to be a very, and to be a good Christian to those around about us. Thank you for all that he came and did and thank you for his willingness to come and to to die on the cross for our sins, so that through obedience to thy will, we will have a hope of eternal life. Father, help us to, to so console those that we might know that are sick, and especially those that have lost loved ones. Father, but most of all, help us to realize that any time that uh, we get up, we're not promised that we'll see the sunset, and help us to realize that we need to be prepared each and every day for death, because it's coming to all of us. Help us to be good and faithful servants, and help us to always be doing everything to bring honor and glory to you. Forgive us for many sins and mistakes. Guard, guide, and protect us. These things we ask in your Son, Jesus Christ, let me pray. Amen.